Um, about two, two years ago, um, almost to the day, I think it virtually is, that I did a presentation on the original sort of the, the last rolling stock replacement project, <laughs> so which is terrifying in many ways. Um, but the fact that I'm not standing here alone today <laughs> sort of says something about the scale of the project, what's happened, and how it's developed over that last two years. So I hope, in terms of um, the presentation today, that you'll get a bit of an understanding of how that has grown. Um, also, the fact that, you know, it's not just about um, the sort of the depot works, which some of the sort of presentation focuses on, but also as a result of that, we've been, um, TFO Engineering have been helping um, DLR um, sort of understand more about sort of the, the trains and the impact on the infrastructure, um, and also in terms of sort of developing the standards. So I'll run through quickly. See, a bit of a delay. Yeah. Excellent. Um, so, um, as I say, I'm so well on um, principal engineering lead, uh, not lead now, discipline lead for um, RSRP. And as I say, in terms of the presentation, um, I'm going to do a section on um, just a bit of a recap for, for those who, who didn't hear the. 2022 20, presentation back in February and um, about what the RSRP project's about. Um, obviously, as uh, Mike said, that we had Alex's presentation last time, which gave a really good introduction, which means I don't have to repeat a lot of things mm -hmm. that I would otherwise potentially have needed to. Um, a bit about um, the objectives, the timeline that we're now currently working with, um, uh, a bit about, so the work, the I'm mainly involved in at the moment is the northern sidings um, and the delivery of that. So I'll talk about that. And, and then some of the challenges coming up in the sort of the, the next year. Um, so I'll let these people join the presentation. <laughs> So then, um, Rasib is then going to. Yes, I'm a Rasib Ripad, a track design engineer. So just lead discipline for track for the southern siding. So we'll talk about, about what is happening in southern siding. We have design change, and that is going into the construction phases now. So I will be talking about different construction stages uh, I'm working on at the moment. So we move to Clark. Hello, I'm Clark. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a track engineer with you about as well, alongside Zoe and Rasib. Uh, I'm currently the discipline lead for the HIF and what is now called BDSE, so it's a renamed uh, project now. Uh, I'll also talk a little bit about Poplar Depot that was done underneath the umbrella of HIF as well to increase the capacity. And then I'll talk about a little bit about the DLR standards update that's happening in order to change some of the standards or fill out the standards in order to uh, assess the new trains and all that. Come through eventually. So, in terms of um, the RSRP um, objectives, <coughs> essentially, so we're we're getting um, a new B twenty three train. Um, the sort of the sort of the as much as there's sort of. A, main reason for that being in terms of looking to replace the sort of the existing um, B92 stock. There's also service enhancements primarily on sort of the, the branches at Lewish and Woolwich and Stratford. Obviously now Woolwich and Stratford also have the Elizabeth line interchange, so they've become sort of fairly major infrastructure hubs. Um, and this is really supporting sort of the um, sort of the mayor's transport strategy across London in terms of sort of a good transport London transport experience and also in terms of supporting the sort of new homes and jobs across the capital. So as Clark was saying, in terms of the HIF, HIF stands for the sort of Housing Infrastructure Fund and it's part of the sort of levelling up Michael Gove's um, sort of department in terms of giving sort of additional money to areas where we've got to do to promote um, the sort of new housing developments. So uh, RSRP have been able to tap into that. And so as part of that, being able to actually sort of buy another 11 trains and sort of part into funding for the, um, the HIF works. So, but as I said, 
bringing on the infrastructure um, or the, the training it isn't just about the depot sort of upgrade works and training stabling that we're talking about a lot today. Obviously, there's also a massive amount of other work that's going on in terms of power upgrades um, and likewise with the sort of depot substation, but also the sort of the finer aspects in terms of the PTI, the RBAR compliance with the door positions changing, all the mirrors and monitors. Um, we've also got a new train simulator that's been, um, being brought in for the new rolling stock for training drivers. Also, all the sort of the linking in with new signaling upgrades as well into the point of sort of so Blackwell Station because of sort of the numbers of people using the system, just looking at sort of being able to get the sort of um, the number of passengers that we're now looking at having off the platforms in a certain sort of amount of time in terms of fire and evacuation and things and evacuation of the station. So in terms of development for that. So there's a massive range of additional work going on, um, as well as the work we're talking about today. And so mainly sort of focusing initially on the works that we're doing um, for the Beckton Depot expansion for the new trains. So as I say, in total, we're going to end up with 54 new trains. There's two of those, though, we're replacing the... Um, the, the B92s. And so it's just to get you a bit of an understanding of the, the site itself and um, the sort of the phasing of the works before we sort of have a look at some of the other timelines and things like that. So work primarily has started um, initially. So as I say, well, I was here two years ago. Um, even at that point, we'd been severely impacted by COVID and meant a bit of a change in terms of how the works were actually planned. So it was always intended that we go in and do the southern sidings first, but because of COVID and the need for the trains being delivered, we had to basically go straight for delivering the northern sidings with the additional capacity that that would bring. Um, so that's where the key focus has been. Um, so all of the northern the sort of yellow and the pink of, was originally part of the initial build. Um, Rasid will talk about the works that we've now started on the southern sidings. And then we've also got um, the maintenance facility building, which is then going to be built following the commissioning of the northern sidings. Um, with some added complications about how we actually get to that site um, once we've, we've built other bits of the depot. And then finally, um, Clark will be talking about the work in terms of the additional southern sidings expansion. So I'm going to be up in the timeline here, which I, I don't there's need too much to sort of focus on the dates, but I think what I wanted to show is this is sort of looking at this year essentially. Um, but what I really wanted to sort of demonstrate that at the moment, because of the way that the works have happened and because of other issues that have happened for the project, um, we're going to end up with a situation this year where we've got B23s arriving. We saw the photo at the very start with them being unloaded off the, um, off the lorries. Um, but at the same time, as, as the trains are arriving, we're trying to find stabling for them. So we're going to have continue to have works on the northern sidings, southern, and also in terms of working on the maintenance facility building, um, southern sidings um, expansion in terms of pushing the design forward as well. So um, obviously we had big fanfare, sort of, I think it was sort of late January, early February 23, in terms of the delivery of the first train. The mayor came down to Beckton and things like that. So it was all, all big fanfare. Um, but we've now got other trains that we've got on the system and there's been network testing as well for those trains. Um, but we've got new trains, further units being delivered this year. Um, so there is a pressure to, to ensure that we have the capacity to do that. Um, so obviously the northern sidings, we're not quite where we wanted to be at this point. Um, so back in... Um, August 23, um, our principal contractor, BGCL, filed for administration. So that basically meant that the northern sidings work was essentially mothballed and made safe for 
pretty much until the beginning of the new year. So since then, um, thankfully, uh, the new principal contractor, Morgan Cinder, was reappointed the original subcontractors. So it's actually meant in terms of continuity, assurance, et cetera, that we've been able to continue. Um, so, um, and likewise, we've, we've sort of, in the interim period, we've been making good progress in terms of the works for the southern sidings. Um, so, so my work primarily is focused at the moment in terms of the northern sidings expansion. Um, I've just sort of got an overlay here. So the yellow area in the bottom picture basically shows essentially where we've um, sort of the, the area of the works that we're talking about. And you can see in the overlay, the red tracks in terms of the proposed alignment over what was there previously. Um, so there's an awful lot of track in terms of new sidings and S and C that have gone in. Um, and I guess in terms of sort of what is unique to DLR, they, they have their own test tracks and they've used them in terms of doing um, ongoing train testing um, across sort of for their fleet. Um, so we can see the test track at the moment in terms of it's running all the way around the outside. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the challenges for that coming um, sort of in the future. But I think in terms of actually why we've got work, why we've got work, uh, I just want to say in terms of looking at the DLR standards. So essentially, um, so the maximum count on bars the track has got it's 100 millimetres. So as a result, in terms of the sort of the maximum levels of can deficiency and things like that, that would limit um, the speed in on the test track in terms of sort of 35 kilometres an hour. So and so although we are now at that speed, that essentially is probably the top speed of where they want to be testing because it's a test track. We're at a point where we also have to accommodate some over speed. So as a result, from that, we've ended up with the section of um, slab track just in the top corner to cope with that 65 metre radius and um, the uh, the additional count that's on at 120. <coughs> so uh, it's on the as many of you probably already know, it's on the site of an old gas works. And so these were sort of some of the pit early pictures of the site being redeveloped in terms of actually um, sort of capping it and um, providing that sort of limit. And at this point, it's still confined with the sort of the original depot um, boundary fence. And so that was the starting point of, of the development work. And so when I did this presentation before, back in um, February 22, this was sort of pretty much where we were in terms of the sort of initial drainage channels going in and sort of um, ballast and we've got a bit of the former um, building and some of the platform or high level walkway piers. Um, oh, it's updating. And then, so obviously, we've now got the opportunity <laughs> to use a lot of drone imagery. So we, we make use of it quite a lot. Um, it's a good way of um, seeing what work's been done. So you can see from January through to October, um, which is sort of after the site's been um, sort of basically made safe last year, sort of a huge amount of work was done in terms of the high level walkway constructions and the track installation with all the, all the track um, around from the um, the Western fan having been constructed. So in terms of where, where we are now, as I say, from the point of view of um, sort of uh, our, the Morgan Sindor and the subcontractor SRS um, now being on site, you know, we just last week, we'd sort of, um, going out and actually doing the, the final inspections in terms of um, looking to sort of identify snags ready for handback. Um, so at the moment, trying to projects, trying to push 
very much in terms of sort of um, doing that or being able to hand the northern siding south towards the towards the end of April. So um, so yeah, those those final snags etc are happening, um, and we're engaging with CAD and with DLR in terms of, um, of capturing everything prior to that. As I say, as much as I've sort of, that's a pretty much a, a built situation and we're just trying to tidy things up. I think for me, in terms of the northern sidings and some of the challenges that are still um, ahead for us, this is the one thing that I'm sort of particularly still interested in and is sort of um, going to sort of uh, maintain uh, the, the challenge of, of track um, is essentially in terms of the test track. Um, primarily in terms of its operation, because it's quite, as I say, the struggle is that from um, the original build, when they were hoping at one point to be able to get up to 50 kilometres an hour on the test track, we've now reduced that down or we, so later on in terms of that being 35. And then we're also being told, well, actually, we might just want to run trains at 25 and, and then at, at down to um, 15 even. So for the level of can that we've got on the slab, that's going to be a real maintenance issue. So obviously there are lots of reasons why, why people want this. <coughs> but from a track maintenance point of view and how that's actually going to pan out is something that we're going to have to work with over time. Um, so the other issue associated with this is also the fact that um, we're changing from the lubrication system on the trains. So that's something we're going to need to work with the train manufacturer CAF in terms of seeing um, how that can be applied on the test track. So on the main line, they've got various systems in terms of um, either being able to deploy the, the spray um, sort of at timely intervals or linked in with the signal loop cable positioning or but here on the test track where you've got trains going back and forwards um, repeatedly you don't necessarily want to be releasing a lubricant every single time you don't want to necessarily be releasing it at the same place and so there's a risk oops, in terms of uh, the connect there's a risk that we're actually going to over lubricate and even in um, Spain when they were doing the testing um, on their test track, there were some locations where they knew that they had issues associated with specific lubricators located on the test track, etc. So, um, so yeah, we will. That's that's one of the sort of the big challenges for the test track, and the other one being um, that the fact that we are going to need to have to access and um, build the maintenance facility building. Um, and that will mean while they're still wanting to have an operational um, test track, um, that we're going to have to actually bridge um, that test track to be able to get um, construction um, vehicles into um, the site. And that's going to be sort of on a nightly basis, essentially, that we're going to need to do that. So the operational complexity of that and ensuring the sort of continued safety of the track um, in those locations is going to be a big challenge going forward. So, Masib, I will leave to talk about the work that they're currently doing. Okay. Yeah, so the siding, so it's best, uh, it's about three new sidings adding up on the southern siding, and uh, where we are tying into the existing on the east side and the west side. Uh, of the depot. So there are like three, eight new uh, SNCs uh, introduced uh, here and which are on the composite sleeper. I think most of the stuff are in the composite sleeper in for the Bacton depot. So just to uh, reduce the footprint of the, uh, of the project basically. And it's all velocity track uh, because it's only so fast speed. So that is all density. And uh, we are providing the full length of um, high walkway uh, for the drivers uh, on, on the, all the way through. 
and there's no can't, so it pull depot is on zero can't, so there is no can't go with the depot, which is a good thing. I think no many depot have zero can't all the all the way. And um, there are some, we are changing some of the ground uh, level of uh, walkways as well, and optimizing basically. And we are introducing also new uh, non adjustable uh, stretcher bar. And I will talk about that later in the slides. And as you can see, there is uh, no uh, test track uh, in the southern siding, which has been removed uh, because um, the northern test track, as Zoe was talking about, will build first. And that's, that's why they have changed the design to use that northern test track because the, the, the test track on the southern side Will own, was only holding uh, two trains, and that's <coughs> therefore there was no um, use of that. So that's why they changed the test track. So we'll talk about uh, one of the possession that happened two weeks ago uh, on the east side of the um, uh, the depot uh, where we uh, removed some of the old old track was there and installed the new SNCs, which are connecting on the eastern side. And uh, one of the um, SNCs is not in service at the moment. That will be clipped and padlocked. And some of the signaling works going on uh, as well, and ET works uh, as well. And I will talk about the demolition of the west side of the wall where we, we, where we are trying to change. Uh, what you can see on the picture is talk about. Yeah, so you can see in the picture we are taking the old track out uh, from the ground for the connection and geotextile and geogrid is going in for where the PNC will be sitting on and leveling up the, uh, the bottom ballast on the, um, for, for the do from the dozer and just tend them lifting of the new panels uh, in and this is the new stretcher what uh, I was talking about um, and this is the first time using using on the southern siding and uh, this is a uh, painted teal just to distinguish from because this will be used in the ATA rails just to distinguish that will be used in the ATA rails so um, that's new stretcher bar and then can see that the side in the end <coughs> low, so this is now going in the, into the service. So only these two roads will be in the service meantime, while the other uh, works are happening in the future. Yeah, so yeah, guys are putting back the comb rail in and signaling, you know, signaling going in to the different location and testing of the comb rail and the new point machine. Uh, getting in uh, as well. And then uh, I was talking about that walkway. We are changing uh, the position of the uh, raised walkway. So as you see in the green, that's where it is at the moment. And <coughs> that uh, has been changed and new tracks is added. So we are cutting back that walkway. Uh, or four, four meter for five meters. So that's where it's gonna be in the future. Uh, but works will be completed in this next uh, possession. Um, so yeah, so this is this is the upcoming possession in May. Uh, so that on the top you can see that's existing at the moment. There's nothing planned uh, on the road yet. So there will be going uh, three. Uh, SNC is in uh, uh, connecting to the existing and using the signals are going in as well and the uh, brake cost slabs that for the walkway will be uh, going in so they will be uh, done in two different days I think so they have one uh, two SNC going on the top and then this bottom one will, will start from here the next uh, uh, section. Uh, what is, yeah, so that's 
upcoming possession in uh, and this is the final uh, B6 possession. This is the middle of the east and west uh, section. So this is no part of the depot, operational depot at the moment. So you can see there are still works going on. They, they already got the track in, um, they go drainage and some of the um, basis for the high risk wall drain as well. And this all segregated with this uh, fencing from the operational depot. And you can also see that um, you, uh, there is already fence uh, as well. So that's work going on. So this will be connected to the east and the west side once the uh, works uh, will finish. And this, um, we, so in the end, this all, so the siding will be connected to the HIF, uh, which club will talk about shortly. So there is uh, that connection in the future to get on the east and the west side as well. So, Clark. Hello, so yeah, moving on to the HIF, uh, which as you can see here, uh, is really south of the southern sidings. Uh, it connects on uh, the east and the west end. Um, so the stage of the project that the HIF is at in terms of design is uh, that the feasibility design was completed by Arcadis in 2023. Uh, and now we're between uh, feasibility and concept. However, the, the, the concept design I believe hasn't been awarded to anyone yet. So, um, so interesting features about the HIF design are this I'll start on this side. So the main, main mainland connection up here. Uh, so there was a lot of feasibility work in terms of how that connection would look and what the arrangement of that uh, connection would be. However, it was uh, kind of dictated a lot by the civils and injection rate requirements of that area. So uh, in terms of track and the work that we did, it wasn't particularly dictated by ours, but it's just worth mentioning. Uh, the design uh, from that connection goes through the ring Ringway Jacobs Yard here and then spans out into 27 sidings in total. Uh, and um, yeah, also another interesting area is its close proximity to Armada Way uh, and the road there. Oh, and also this here. Hold on. I'm not sure if anyone's familiar with Beckton, but there's a fly over here which was meant to go over the river. But it's incomplete, so that always causes a bit of fun whenever you look at that. Um, so uh, it's now been kind of descoped a little bit down to between 17 and 19 rows, uh, as you can see here. Um, next slide. So uh, that descoping has meant that we've now got a lot of space in the HIF area. Or as I say, we haven't begun the concept design yet. But going into that, we're going to look whether or not we can use this space in order to create a more desirable alignment and track area, or whether or not we need to future proof that area so that they can expand it again in the future, basically. So that's kind of where we're at the hip at the moment. And I'm not going to talk too much about it just because that's really where we are. We're just between con um, feasibility and concept. So uh, underneath the umbrella of HIF as well, and uh, my colleague Kaijo Bader in the back. Uh, assisted in creating a feasibility study of the existing depot. Um, so Poplar Depot uh, at the moment currently serves the existing stock B2007. So uh, as, I, as I mentioned, different types of stock, just, just bear in mind that B23 is the newest stock, B2007 and B92 are uh, the existing stock and their names, uh, their naming convention is the year that they were introduced. Um, so yeah, uh, the feasibility set out to assess whether or not um, the, the popular depot was compatible with uh, how the B2007 stock from its existing stock. So uh, from that, a, an analysis of the arrestors was conducted, an analysis of the gapping was conducted. So previously as part of kind of the overall gauging of the network for the introduction of BTZ B23, we had already um, 
conducted a system-wide gap and analysis of the track to see how the B23 performed um, across the network in comparison to the existing stock. And we found that the B23 did outperform the existing stock. However, with depots, you do have some strange arrangements. So we still did conduct a gap and analysis of the depot as well. Um, and then also the main thing at the top is uh, we were looking at the capacity of the depot and whether or not the existing stabling roads were long enough uh, in order to hold the new longer B23 train. And also done by Kojo here, as you can see, uh, he's, he's looked at the um, existing positions of the platform, which served the existing stock, assessed whether or not they're compatible with the access and egress of the, of the new train as well. So the, uh, so the, the, the outcome of that feasibility study at Public Depot was that it can house uh, just as much comparable B23 stock as the existing B2007 stock. So on to this, other than just capacity, um, we've also been involved with looking at the gauging across the network and whether or not the, the network can suitably accommodate the running of the B2000, B23 stock. Uh, so part of that meant that when we were working, doing gap and analysis, for example, or when we were looking at, um, we, were, we worked a few nights doing some gauging analysis to within platforms and stuff like that. So in those activities, we would normally refer to the standards and then see what they say and, and assist us in, in guidance and what we were doing. In doing that, I think us and a lot of engineers approaching the DLR standards realise that the standards are actually quite thin. Um, they're not. So, so a lot of the standards kind of have got a, a one paragraph section which refers to standard drawings. Uh, there's not really any guidance or anything like that. So it was determined beforehand, not by us, we're not going to take all the credit, but it was determined beforehand that um, that would lead to a lot of queries to standards in the future and small requirements for updates to the standards. So the uh, standards update project was born. So the, the, the part which we've mainly been involved with is the gauging standards. So the introduction of, of an overall gauging standard. At the moment, uh, this is just an example. This is one paragraph for what we would normally consider to be a 12 page fair and iron standard, which just refers to a standard drawing. So, So one thing that we've mainly been kind of interested in uh, in the DLR standards is uh, the definition of throw. So I'm not particularly sure if anyone in the room is rusty or familiar or anything like that with, with throw or how it's defined. Um, but in terms of our definition uh, in OU engineering, it is defined as the deflection of any element of a vehicle from its original position on straight track due to the curvature of the track. So it's how much it moves as, as the curvature of the track tightens and becomes more severe, basically. Uh, so, and it's important to note as well that the degree of throw that is applied to a vehicle when it goes over the curve is worsened if the overhang of the vehicle is longer as well. So it's it's not only dependent on, on the radio of the track, it's also that. and. Also, it's important to note that um, sorry, yeah. So yeah, uh, it's also it's also important to note that it, it's dependent on the radio of the track and it's dependent on the overhang, but it's largely independent of the width of the vehicle as well. And that is an important point to make because uh, it's about its relation to itself on straight track and not the rail. It doesn't the, the width of the vehicle from the rail doesn't necessarily impact on the value of throw that you would that you would get. So that's an introduction to throw. Now let's talk about it. So uh, this is so these two formula here are, are, are the formula that are <coughs> in the DLR standards. So what they are is um these terms relate to the standard formula that are shown in the um, LU and their rail standards, basically. So what they are is a simplification of that overall formula for individual stocks. 
but they only show the maximum throw of a vehicle. They're, they're, you can't use those formula in order to determine what the throw is at any point of a vehicle, basically. So, so obviously, when we approached it, when the B23 was coming in, that caused us difficulties because, because we've got a new vehicle with new dimensions, we couldn't use those formula in order to calculate the throw of a specific element of a vehicle. So what we've done is we've suggested that um, the, the formula for throw be re-expanded into what we now what we have on, on um, network run and LU. So, so they're more simplified in, in this version, but now that there's more rolling stock and there's more things to consider with the introduction of the new stock, we think it's best that it's been re-expanded and, and introduced back into the original formula, basically. So Another interesting thing about the formula that I've shown on the DLR standards are that it's separated into two. So you'd have two sets of formula, uh, one for each stock, and then those formula are separated into two for depending on the radio as well. So at tighter radio, you'd use one, one formula, and then at flatter radio, you'd use another formula. And that is because as the, the track flattens and the radio flattens, the, the overhang of the vehicle and the throw of the vehicle has a lesser impact on how poor its clearance is than the width of the vehicle. So as I said earlier, throw doesn't depend necessarily on the width of the vehicle, but the incursion of, of that vehicle does matter depending on how wide it is. So, so that's why there's two separate formula and that kind of, because, we were looking back and changing the formula back to their original, as they're shown in Network Rail and LU. Um, this distinction was kind of no longer really needed because the original formula were only showing maximum throw as opposed to the individual element of throw. So, so we've kind of simplified it and also removed this this limit in radio as I've described. Basically. So. Uh, I mentioned incursion. So incursion is defined as the point which sticks out the most. No, no, no sorry, sorry. Incursion is how much a certain point sticks out from the track at a given radii. Maximum incursion is the maximum that any point along the vehicle sticks out at a given radii. So what we've tried to do as well is incorporate that into the standards because the original tables within the standards are quite useful for engineers to approach uh, because they can just take numbers from those without having to look at what is in the formulas and just use them for their own calculations basically. So we've also defined that within the standards now. Um, as you can see there. So how incursion helps is where we've where we previously had only throw within these tables, which is the deflection of a point from itself. Uh, because, because we've removed um, the formula for maximum throw, these tables kind of, kind of no longer make sense. So as you can see, as you go beyond that limit in radio, the throw drops off significantly, whereas the incursion is quite a smooth value that can be applied across a, a, a range of values, and it makes a bit more sense to show that within the standards. Um, and incursion as a number uh, is quite useful because it incorporates different elements of things that you need to total in order to calculate things. So, for example, the places of safety dimensions. Now, instead of having three different segments here, you've got half gauge, you've got your um, width of your vehicle, and you've got the throw, and then you just add your safety buffer and stuff like that in order to get the place of safety dimension. So it's a much more easy to, easy to use number than having to calculate those things yourself. And then the same for clearance points and fouling points on the DLR. Uh, the fouling point is just denoted as uh, the total of the two incursions of trains, uh, basically. Um, so, yeah. Uh, in terms of the DLR standards update, uh, this is kind of where we're at now. Uh, so we're in final review. Um, okay, sorry, not okay. This um, Atkins are doing some brick work in terms of the creation of that standard and the updates to the drawings. We're just kind of acting as 
people who use their own standards and then look at these new standards and give our own impression of, of what they are basically. So we're kind of an advisory role of just having an outside look on, on what the updates to the standards are. Um, but yeah, this is where we're at in the project at the moment. It's 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 due to be issued and finalised from there. So I'll invite my colleagues back up and see if there's any questions. I think I just yeah, and thank you for thank you, Rusty. It's just in terms of it's been really interesting in terms of with the, a big project like Beckton and the number of different contractors and subcontractors that we've been had on the project. That the questions that they've had in relation to the standards and the interpretation of the standards and identifying where where things are missing. So it's been a unique opportunity really to actually capture a lot of that, which we've then been passing back um, to DLR um, and even to the point, um, especially I think clearances has been a has a, been a big one in terms of um, that how that's interpreted and how it's how people are actually able to model that on DLR um, with the different um, stops and the different throws. And especially with the, the degree of throw that you get on a 40 metre radius curve within the zipper, which is fairly significant and the impact it has on the platforms. But it's especially, I think, you know, we've got the opportunity now, especially with the Southern Sidings expansion works in terms of um, having a look at what we've built the standards or that we told the sort of the original designers for northern southern sidings to build to and, and those interpretations from those standards and thinking about how we want to use them again and so yeah we're really keen in terms of learning the lessons from northern southern sidings that that is is taken on board in terms of that work yeah it's good it's good that we have the opportunity with the HIF project and the bdse project as well that that these other projects are ongoing and we can yeah, so I'm in quite a comfortable position with, with my job. Excellent. Don't say it so reluctantly. <laughs> so half our compliance has been mentioned a couple of times. So have you had to had to be changes to the passenger platforms at that stations because of differences between the existing and the new rolling stock? Yeah, there's not a lot. I think obviously a lot of the platforms at DLR, thankfully, straight. <laughs> <laughs> so that's that's a really big advantage. Um, so in terms don't of mind the gap. <laughs> well, indeed, I guess some of the issues are there. I think there was sort of um, some of the issues are in terms of how how they've been actually built. So it's I think it's almost looking at it as an opportunity to review again all of the PTI. Obviously, that they previously had a derogation against some platforms and some locations in in terms of achieving our bar. So the, the in getting the new stock, there's obviously been a requirement to review all of those platforms again in terms of what's being achieved. Um, and yeah, it's not something that we're specifically, uh, we've looked at, but certainly Rob Hum and um, oh. Harry Morgan have been leading on that in terms of, but there will be some platform mods that are required as a result of, of the new train, um, just in terms of sort of where we've got curvature close to the ends of platforms and the impact that that has, so, yeah. but. Not as big an issue as potentially on a new. There was a, a Malcolm Dobdell question popped up on chat, but it disappeared again before I could read it. Yeah, okay. uh, Thamesmead yeah. extension. Is there any? Yeah, so the question is specifically: Has there been any thought yet about the implications for the depot and fleet if the Thamesmead extension goes ahead? Uh, yeah. So on, especially on here where. Can I go back? Is that all right? So, as you can see, kind of 
the general footprint of the extension mm -hmm. goes. Actually, it might be better to go oh, back and look at goes through the depot. Just to show one of the difficulties. Does the extension go through the depot? No, it oh, goes around the out. Oh. It goes oh. round the outside, oh. but there's going to there need to be another. T oh, okay. TVA essentially. Yeah. Is it going to be an extension for fire? No, so, so essentially, <laughs> Sorry, what, was with fact, it, it has been, but it's primarily, I think, oh we're looking at various options oh in much. terms of. <laughs> oh, they were kicking each other. That's all right. So, yeah, so they're looking at, again, there are various options in terms of how the depot connects in with, um, with the going north. Yeah, to go north and then. Basically, Thamesmead is going to go all the way around, oh, essentially around the perimeter, oh, so. northern perimeter, and then it comes down to then go under the Thames. So, yeah, I guess for some of those uh, provisional additional sidings or whatever could be yeah, end up yeah, needing yeah. to be. It should be possible. To link it should be. Yeah. But that's basically what the designers already looked at in terms of how it links in with the depot and, and some of the works, which I think sort of tie in with some of in this area in particular. Yes, it did. There's a, yeah, been quite a lot of studies done. So yeah. Marvin, what radius is that? Coming in the depot. So most of these are most of these are all forty. It's it's un, it's rare yeah. but not to be forty. Though. Nothing less than forty. Generally, it's within no. the zone principle. Yeah. Yeah. So what's that side in in Poplar? The really tight one. Is that forty? I don't think so. Just down 38, thirty-eight yeah. is the minimum you're allowed in siding. Yeah. Thanks, thanks, Tom. <laughs> Jim. Spray lubrication. Yeah. Do not decommission and fix lubrication until you've got an awful lot of experience with the odometry. Edinburgh Tram Stage mm. One was a new system with spray, yeah. and it took forever and for a long time. All the sharp curves were being hand bashed mm -hmm. because. You wanted to get the experience, wanted to get everything running, the driver training and everything, but getting the odometry right for the spray lubrication was a complete nightmare. And, uh, you know, basically it was very, very quickly because if you're down to 25 metre radius with that. Uh, that's why they went over to hand bashing, the contractor was hand bashing, mm. simply to preserve the wheels and the rails mm. before the odometry got going. So the other question is going to be how on earth you determine that it's doing it in the right place if the mm. fixed spread, fixed equipment's still, still there, there. Yeah. and you've then got to work out whether... Uh, I agree. I think it, it's it's going to be really difficult we've got a meeting set up next week with systems engineers to understand because what do you even now in terms of the baseline before the b23 start running what data do we want to make sure we've got in terms of the the line in terms of either wheel rail rates or particular locations mm. of, of rail where you know because realistically you're not going to be going out and doing swabs or whatever you're going to be seeing what you're actually and yeah, perhaps, you, perhaps you'll have to colour the grease from the <laughs> for the spray so you can see it. Yeah. It's lying somewhere different. Yes, yeah, so you can see it's quite a good idea. Yeah, yeah. 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 I'm charging for it. Yeah. <laughs> Mark, I'm still going to hand up again. <laughs> so, if I can make a contribution, Tom yeah. Mann gave a lecture to the PWI a couple of weeks ago who said there weren't the only track based lubricators were for check rails. And that all the existing vehicles have a solid stick lubricator for the flange. So that's right for the existing. Yeah. So yeah, the existing yes. all have solid so stick. So that's why stick we don't have any. There are no no others around. So I, it's just going to be, especially with the gradual introduction of new stock and the B twenty three is being reduced. There's just going to be a situation where <laughs> you haven't got a fixed situation either. You're going to sort of you're reducing. The number of trains which have got the fixed lubrication and increasing <laughs> with the spray. So there's also the challenge of getting spray onto the between the wheel tread and the wheel the railhead and harming the adhesion, which might yeah. be a bit of a challenge, mm -hmm. especially with an ATO. Yeah. <laughs> so are you, are you going to, 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 to in terms of the spray? 
Which it's only you only targeting the flange, not doing tread. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You that's know, that's the intention, yeah, absolutely. Okay. But yeah, but, and so, but there's also, you know, there are restrictions that CAF have set up in terms of how it's used. But yeah, absolutely not on the tread is. The, and I was going to say there are some but, some systems that use both the same spray for tread and flange. So flange for managing tight curves and keeping lateral right. um, thing and then the, the tread for obviously of managing squeal and, and wear mm -hmm. rates. So uh, so your yours is specifically just that. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the new tram the new trains are CAF, are they? Yes. Right. The Edinburgh trams are CAF. Okay. So and it's the, worth the head of uh, CAF at Edinburgh has been there from before the start. Okay. So mm -hmm. they, they really need to be talking to Sinead. Right. about all her problems with the odometry when they were first introduced. Yeah, sounds yeah. great. Get names and yeah, no, brilliant. You can, uh, you can ask about spray, Lou. Oh, is it gone? Yeah. <laughs> so do you know, or well, spray loop system, if it is triggered at certain geographic points or does it have some fancy system where it actually measures the coefficient of friction well, on the rail. No, it's oh, not it's, doing that. It's it's, it's just defined points. We get here and it sprays. It can be GPS it or it can be yeah. Or or even a time system. Oh, and looking okay. at because we it was a case of whether or not by the time you ended up looking at the number sort of especially with DLR with the sort of the number of radii etc. It's got. It was a case of would you are really you want to absolutely do it for every single radii or by the time you've done that do you just do it every so often along the run it's the same number of sprays essentially so does that is that better or worse so it's a study there for someone yeah it's it. really good uh i've got three questions because i've had to wait so long uh <laughs> you no uh the first one is is the is the depot fully si uh, de signaled or is there still no so it was not so it's signaled, but it's not handwork points. Oh, but it's so not ATO. So the only so it's not ATO railway on the yeah. main line, and the yeah. test track will be ATO. Yeah. But the main signalling is is yeah, it's it's yeah. control scarred. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and do the new the B twenty threes have the same wheel profile as yeah. the old ones? So we're still gonna have the. Potentially, yeah. Need yeah. 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 No, that's not going to be lost. Okay, <laughs> good. Uh, and the third one, on the drone, can you go to the drone image? Uh, Which one? It was like one of the earlier ones. Uh, yeah. It looked to be like a trap point. Uh, oh, so again, we've got lots of work that hasn't been installed. So we're partially installing various bits of work. Yeah, that one there. Yeah. So on the, on the right hand. Sorry. Yeah, there. No, so no, so yeah. what this so so this here, which hasn't been built, this is going to be the straight of the test right. track. Oh, okay, yeah. But essentially, it's been used a bit. It's a bit of a hall road at the moment. Yeah, yeah. Just to actually get access round. So this this is a sort of um, I think it's an SV one hundred or CV one hundred, which will go into the test mm -hmm. track here. So there'll be there's going to be another platform or higher way here within the test track and then that connects just before so all of this section here is um, all the way around here will be uh, ballasted um, so it's a bit weird as well so it, on so we've got the snc here and the, but then there's also this this area here is going to be 113 for whatever reason <laughs> so, and then it's going to be ATA on on this because they want the, the idea was originally that the, the test track would um, emulate a variety of different track yeah. forms across across the network, but it's only a short length, and yeah, it's um, but ultimately, yeah, the whole depot is eighty pounds, is it? The rest of it, yeah, a lot of it, yeah. We've got some. There is, a, there is some that's not. So we've got a couple. There are some roads. So where we're basically reusing some of the existing stabling, we have kept that that bell and it's been tamped. Yeah. To hell with a cost. Yeah. Thank you. Cool. Some sort of suggestion popped up on the screen just then. If I, Go on. From, a, from a vehicles and operational point of view, I noticed that there's some stub track in the new southern uh, sidings expansion. 
I was wondering what consideration was given to introducing a, 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 a decent amount of stub track compared to the current level. I think most of the sidings have, you know, both connection at both ends via a fan. Is it a question of future proofing and making sure you've got the room to get other sidings in, or is it just a capacity thing, or what, what your thoughts were around that sort of thing? So, what was the question, sorry? So, on the on single the single ended sidings. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, yes, single ended sidings. Right. Um, what? Is it, is it just a case of trying to cram in as much stabling as possible and you're sacrificing having a fan at both ends and just accepting there's going to be some operational problems around that? Okay. So so in, so it's the correct answer to the question, the, the continuation fund? It's, yeah. That's so, part of it. So, yeah, so, so yeah the, the, the reasoning is because of the space, originally because of the space that we had at either end and whether or not we could connect it back in for all those um, stabling roads. Another thing is just that there wasn't an original requirement to have double ended side in there. Oh, right, okay. But now they're also looking at installing a attenuation. Is, pond. What's the word? Attenuation. Attenuation pond for the for the drainage throughout the depot oh, as well. Okay. In that, yeah. Yeah. so there's going to be a bit of sailing club in Yes. Yeah. Good. Just coming back to Bexley. So it. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it was a case, it was looked, I mean, they have looked at it and we, and you could get it. But the thing was that you had double, often it was either a double or a single berth siding, wasn't yeah. it? And then you'd have a whole load of extra points to maintain. So I guess there's, there's a balance between how likely you are to get a train stuck mm. with all the additional point work and track work that you then have to maintain for the, for the benefit of having double ended with the way that it works, given that the main push is towards the TVA, so yeah. And if you've got single berth sidings and they're long vehicles, now you don't have to worry about accidentally blocking blocking stuff in anymore, like you do with shorter vehicles. Then it starts to make sense. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. From what I know, generally the the amount of room that you've got on there doesn't allow for the, the track to yeah and give you double sidings anyway. So thank you. You did mention attenuation ponds, um, so. I, when the whilst you're doing the design, when the did you consider changing the drainage aspect in terms of um, more drainage? Because one one of the things concerning is that drainage, uh, especially channels, needs to be bigger to take into account uh, what's happening with climate change. Is that something that was considered or done? I mean, they're huge. I mean, those channels are huge. Were they already? Were they already managed? I mean, uh, but I, yeah. I would be astonished. I mean, the main concern is just how how will they really be used personally in terms of that capacity. They also, in terms of the build, they've caused a few trouble. They're really restrictive in terms of being able to get across the ones that the channels were in with the um, with the ballast in between. They're not they're not massively robust, so they're quite vulnerable. So it just means then trying to traverse around the site in terms of building really quite tricky so i understand in terms of there's lots of advantages about being able to lift the covers and be able to clear them out I've, we've obviously had quite a few sites been fine but you know a lot of them are really really deep i yeah. just can't i just can't see that we ever get to that point so i would like to see again in terms of the the HIF works, the drainage and the channels is one thing that would be good to actually review yeah, sure. as to whether or not that's that's a benefit to continue with that same design. Just just to pick up on that point, one of the changes that was made to the drainage design, I think, because originally there were going to be bigger tanks around yeah. because they did away with the bigger tanks. They put that capacity back into the drainage system itself, so they're almost like a continuous mm. attenuation thing, which is why the, so the size there. So it's composite sleepers throughout the whole thing, and I've had a whinge about that last yeah, time, yeah. I think. Yeah. So is it all composites on the turnouts as well? Yeah, it is. Well, for you. Uh, and so I was interested to know, for those of you who know, I'm not a, a sort of pure P, P way man, sorry, right. a track man. Uh, so you've now got those channels going all the way, I've noticed, stiffening channels along the, the turnouts, yeah? Yeah. 
So that's the sort of key thing you have now, is it, to restrict mercury? They, they were on the other, the, within the de depot SEC. Yeah, as well. So okay, in so terms of actually well, trying to avoid, to limit the kick. So that's to try and sort of stiffen up around the switches, yeah? yeah. Right, good, well done, Paul. So, fast crossings, I noticed. Surely no, not, not no. I saw not, one on that was the, the existing bit. depot. That's what's in right. the existing. So what, what what's your crossings then? What are they? Semi wheels. Okay, fabulous. Yeah. Semi wheels were great. <laughs> Where did you get was that a spare cast crossing you had or was before it before my before, time? But before? um when they did the the first batch of southern sidings mm. extension, I think mean, about 2007, the, the engineers at the time, Robbie Serco, demanded they have cast crossings in there. Wow. <laughs> Rumour has it on the basis they could whip them out and use them on the main line sometimes. But, uh, <laughs> never quite worked that way. Interesting. Thanks. So the, the S and C, is it all simple um, <clears throat> left handed, right handed turnout, or is there some complicated tandems or slips? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, I don't know if you saw Alex Price. Um, presentation last last time, but yeah. Alex went through um, essentially on DLR. A lot of the time, they look to use really standard turnouts, which obviously helps with spares as well. So, primarily in the depot, and again for just space constraints, they're sort of got generally straight mains, forty meter. I remember the first in, uh, where you had you had straight crossings, and because of the geometry, you had to have curved crossings through the curved crossing. Yeah. I sort of couldn't talk because he'd understand it more than me. And I remember then it was slightly different, but otherwise it was single leads really. Yeah. Didn't have anything complicated, did we? They're, they're only 11 metres long as well, so yeah, generally the necessity, the necessity for more complex S&C just didn't yeah. you know. I, I'd, It's obviously a depot, it's obviously slow speed, and you can, but you can see in terms of the number of 40 metre radius curves and things, it's not easy geometry. It's not, you know, that... From a design point of view, you understand why they've done it to get as many sidings in as possible. It's tight, but it's tight. it's tight and yeah, it looks a lot tighter on no the No spring nose. <laughs> spring nose in the depot. Well done. <laughs> Your blue engineering sidings. <laughs> is it that? Is there going to be road access to? So the no. No, oh, no, no. I I'm not sure. So yeah, I thought <laughs> I did, I there was a talk, wasn't there? There was gonna at one point there was gonna be an idea that then you'd have an exit off Armada Way yeah. here as well. Yeah. And that, that potentially mm. that we'd have some form of level crossing going yeah. across so that you yeah. could access you've got, you've got to have access yeah. to yeah. Here, here. Yeah, these these are strange. So they've kind of been really knocked know. off the agenda until future provision to have them. The reason why they're just not just normal side ends is because they're they're um, distance from the main line and the signals requirements of that. So, um, so it's just a bit of space utilization basically at the moment. But there's a, there's quite a lot of room on the yeah, side here. Yeah. So we always said in terms of line side spare or mm. or storage, which deal I was often really struggling to find that there would be a real opportunity there to actually make use of it. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I need I need to ask a question at this point. I don't really understand why it's an engineering siding. As, well, what, what do we call an engineering siding as opposed to any other sort of siding? Oh, it's, it's just unsignaled, basically. So oh, it's right. not operational. It's not an operational siding. So it doesn't seem to stop. It's shorter. Yeah, it's engineering. Uh, yeah. Okay. And, yeah, and that is because mm. of its proximity. Yeah. Why are you Go on, Tom. Um, how many new engineering sidings are we getting? Well, I know. <laughs> <laughs> how many would you like? So <laughs> it's just, Get so, the ends out. Yeah. <laughs> So I think this is the thing in terms of um, Alex, I know Tom have been looking at engineers creep for DLR. So there is a, a need for that discussion in order for it to actually be fit for purpose. That'd be un unelectrified, will it? I'll take it. Yeah. And, and, and with road access so you can get road. <laughs> well, well, yeah, because you want to get plant in. Yeah. Because yeah. yeah. at the moment, obviously, you've got, <coughs> you've got the main depot and so that's for all the train delivery they're coming in. Again, they were due to be using, oh, we've gone through, but we were due to be using, there's a train delivery road on the new HIP uh, or the new um, maintenance facility building. But because that's not built, 
they're having to use an existing train delivery yeah. road that's here to then bring bring them in. So yeah, it's around. Go on, Mike. So, so I was I was going to say don't let the engineering side be descoped, but I echo John's comments that not only don't let them be descoped, but they des you've got to have road access for engineering sides and suitable storage facilities. Mm -hmm. It's it's something that I would guess many urban railways struggle with. Certainly, the underground <laughs> struggles with it. I don't think the Elizabeth line has found it easy, despite the facilities it's, it has at Abbeywood. So engineering sorties are essential. This is a significant expansion to the DNR. <coughs> yeah. Therefore, it will need more maintenance, more renewal. Yeah. Therefore, you need more engineering sidings. And those engineering sidings have to be designed and built to suit the requirements of the maintenance organisation. So go and talk to Tom and Jonathan first, <laughs> and then you'll work out what's needed there. Yeah. Sorry, I'm a bit I think passionate about it. Your master. Really yeah. we, like, yeah. we like passion. I think it's your like master. Passion. Is, is the hand up coming yeah. online? But you don't, don't write, I think it is. Yeah, I, yeah just follow on from the discussion around the engineering side is there and think about usability. Um, whether, Zoe, you mentioned most of the radius in the depot, about 40 metres, um, which limits the ability to get the likes of a lever tamp or the like of that round without having to take the juice rail off. Um, so whether the consideration around the track radius in that area, whether it be um, eased out to 70 plus or indeed where there's no juice on it at all, um, except in the you know, limit of travel for the B route, the network's probably limited, um, but yeah, just sort of future proof in that future element. Yeah, we could. It's probably a bit more far down the line for some of that really, but yeah, it's a nice, nice idea, but it, agreed, it, it causes a lot of problems and um, yeah, again, something that um, DLR were working on and Alex is spending a lot of time looking at. You could probably build a beaver tap siding on the new Thamesmead extension. <laughs> <laughs> In terms of, and I guess this is part of the issue. I mean, the, I think DLR have been really lucky to, to a certain extent get this this land. They really struggle. In terms of now, in terms of trying to buy, get land in and around central London is just really, really difficult. Um, so, uh, yeah, exactly. So we don't, there's not very much. And again, it, I mean, there was a sort of obviously the talk of with Poplar in terms of redeveloping that site, but it's, you know, again essential it's really useful to have a, a depot sidings in the in the center close to where because becton's right on the outside you don't want to have to be moving everything all the way out here if you've got can't, can't resist to chip in oh. and say because i lost that battle to retain the old bow uh, railway works on the North London line at Devon Road, which would have been the perfect site for a depot which I had lost uh, when we were looking at the auctions in the 1880s. Oh, no, 1980. There you go. Alberto, it's yeah. good. Oh, no, Later on. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mike, John, Tom, a lot of thanks. Um, after this brilliant presentation. So yeah, yeah. first of all, I want to thank all of you for coming and for participating on the session. It wouldn't be possible without you and the help of the RSSB for providing the facilities. But a special thank goes to uh, all of you. So sorry, uh, Rosie, Clark, your presentation uh, has been great. It's, it has enlightened us with the hard work that's going on to deliver this endeavor and the complexity of it working in the middle of a big city like London, introducing 54 new trains and completing the expansion of the depot is uh, a big challenge. Um, but with this presentation, you've also provoked a thoughtful discussion. Yeah. <laughs> uh, there's a couple of things that is a big piece of work so over 33 sidings with the half extension probably around 40 years and see if no more. New sightings, slab, ballast track, uh, a test track with different speeds, different kind of efficiencies and changes to standards. So uh, thank you for the presentation, your ability to 
present such a complex project with clarity is being commendable. So thank you again, and thank you all of you for your attendance today. Thank, thank you. you. Some of us are going to head through the red lines. Oh, no, yes. <laughs> thank you again. <laughs>